Chapter 31 Friday the 21st of November The way station of Otsu had been bustling all day in a crescendo of excitement, anticipation paired with fear over final preparations for tonight's stop of the impossibly august visitors, Shogun Nobusada and the Princess Yazu. For weeks the citizens had been brooming streets, cleaning all dwellings, hovels, outhouses, roofs, walls, wells, gardens manicured, new tiles, shojis, tatamis, verandas, with the inn of many flowers, the best and biggest in the whole of Otsu, still in a state of near panic. It had begun the moment it was known the hallowed travellers had declined to stay in the nearby shogunate castle of Sakamoto that had graced the area since before Sekigahara, selecting the inn instead, everything must be perfect. The patron wailed, awed and at the same time petrified. Anything not perfect will merit beheading or at the very least a whipping, man, woman or child. Tales of the honour done to us this one night will be remembered through the ages, our successes or failures. The Lord High Shogun himself, in all his glory, his wife, a sister of the deity, O Ko. Late in the afternoon, veiled, surrounded by guards and counsellors and well screened from being observed, Shogun Nobusada hurried from his palanquin through the gates into the isolated section of the inn reserved for him, with the princess and their entourage of personal bodyguards, servants, her ladies in waiting and maids. There were forty traditional raised bungalows of four rooms each, surrounding the inner sanctum of the shogun's sleeping quarters and bathhouse, many of the covered verandas interlocking in a maze of pleasing walks and bridges over delicate pools and streams that came down from tiny mountains and all self-contained within a high, thick hedge of manicured hemlocks. The room was warm and spotless, with new tatamis and polished charcoal braziers. Nobusada threw his veiled hat and outer clothes aside, tired and querulous. As always the palanquin had been uncomfortable and the ride bumpy. I hate this place already, he said to their chamberlain, whose head was touching the floor beside those of an echelon of maids. It's so small and stinks and I ache all over. Is the bath ready? Ah, yes, sire, everything is as you require. Otsu at long last, sire, Princess Yazu said gaily, sweeping in with several ladies in waiting. Tomorrow we arrive home and everything will be marvelous. She dropped her huge, also veiled, hat and outer clothes. Maids scrambled to gather them up. Tomorrow we will be home. Home, sire, bypassing a few way stations will be well worth it, nay. Oh, yes, Yazu chan if you say so, he said, smiling at her, quickly caught up in her exuberance. You will meet all my friends, cousins, aunts, uncles, elder sister and baby sister, my dear stepbrother Sachi, he's nine this year, she twirled with happiness, and hundreds of less close relatives and in a few days you'll meet the emperor and he will greet you as his brother too and solve all our problems and we will live in tranquility ever after. It's cold in here. Why isn't everything ready? Where is the bath? Their chamberlain, a portly, graying man of fifty with few teeth and heavy jowls, had already been here a day with an advance party of special maids and cooks to prepare their quarters, and particular foods and fruits, with an abundance of polished rice, which the shogun's delicate stomach required and the princess demanded. Superb flower arrangements by a master of Ikebana abounded. Again he bowed, inwardly cursing her. Extra charcoal heaters are ready, Imperial Highness. The bath is ready. Your light meal just as you and Shogun Nobusada ordered, dinner the same. It will be the most sumptuous. Amiko, our bath. At once her chief lady-in-waiting led her out and down the corridor, cocooned by other ladies and maids like the queen bee she was. Nobusada glared up at the chamberlain and stamped his tiny foot. Am I to be kept waiting? Show me the bath and send for the masseurs, I want my back rubbed now. And make sure there is no noise, I forbid noise. Yes, sire, the captain issues the order daily and I will send the masseurs to the bathhouse, sire. Sarko will be. Sarko, she's not as good as Mako, where's Mako? So sorry, she's sick, sire. 
Tell her to get better. Tell her to be better by sunset. No wonder she's sick. I feel sick. This foul journey. Barker. How many days on the road? It should be at least 53 and it's less than. Why all the haste? The captain of the escort waited for the chamberlain in the garden. He was in his thirties, bearded, highly trained, a renowned master of swords. His adjutant hurried up. Everything is secure, sir. Good. It should all be routine by now, the captain said, his voice weary and edged. Both wore light traveling armor and hats and two swords over shogunate tunics and pantaloons. Only one more day, then our problems get worse. I still cannot believe the council and guardian would allow such a dangerous venture. His adjutant had heard the same thing said every day. Yes, captain, at least we will be in our own barracks, with hundreds more men. Not enough, never enough, we should never have left. But we did and karma is karma. Check the rest of the men and make sure the evening roster of guards is correct. And then tell the horse master to look at my mare, to take a look at her left foot, she may have split her hoof. Shoeing horses was unknown in Japan at this time. She almost shied passing the barrier, then come back and report. The man hurried away. The captain was more satisfied than usual. His tour of the inn and its grounds within the high, giant perimeter bamboo fences, and particularly this sector, the hedged area with a single gateway, had reassured him that the shogun's cluster of bungalows was easy to defend, that all other travelers had been forbidden the inn for this night, that the watch knew the password and were clear on their prime duty. No one was allowed within five meters of the shogun or his wife uninvited, and no one, ever, with any weapons, except the guardian, the council of elders and himself, and any guards accompanying him. The law was well known, the punishment for an armed approach death, for both the armed man and the unalert guards, unless pardoned by the shogun personally. Ah, Chamberlain, is there any change of plans? No, Captain. The old man sighed and mopped his brow, his jowls shaking. The August ones are bathing as usual, then they will rest as usual, take their real bath and massage at sunset as usual, after which they will dine as usual, play go as usual and go to bed. All is in order, here, yes. The captain had a garrison of 150 samurai at any one time within the compound that measured about 200 meters square. A unit of 10 men guarded the only entrance, a pleasing bridge over a stream that led to tall decorative beams and equally ornate gates. Around the whole perimeter hedge a samurai was stationed every ten paces. These would be relieved by fresh units from the 600 samurai lodging in barracks just outside the main gate or nearby in other inns. Patrols would scour the garden and fence line discreetly, as noise and an obvious samurai presence infuriated the princess and therefore her husband. Above them the clouds were thickening, a bleak, misted sun not yet on the horizon, a high wind toying with the clouds. It was cold and promised to be colder. Servants were lighting lanterns amongst the shrubs, their light already reflected in the pools, and glistening off rocks that had been moistened for that effect moments ago. It's beautiful, the captain said. Easily the best, though most of the other inns have been good. This was the first time he had ever made such a journey. All his life he had been within or near Yedo Castle, with or near Nobusada, or the previous shogun. Beautiful, yes, but I'd rather have the Lord Shogun and his wife in Sakamoto Castle than here. You should have insisted. I tried, Captain, but, but she decided. I will be glad when we are in our own barracks, when they are within the palace walls and even gladder when we and they are safe at home in Yedo Castle. Yes, the Chamberlain said, privately weary of his master and mistress and the constant fault-finding, nagging and petulance. Still, he thought, his back aching, wanting a bath and massage too, and the attentions of his youthful friend, I suppose I would be the same if I were as exalted as them, so mollycoddled from birth, and only sixteen. May I ask the password, Captain? Until the middle of the night it is, Blue Rainbow. Two hundred meters away on the eastern outskirts of the village, 
an old broken-down farmhouse huddled at the end of an alley not far from the Tokaido and the Otsu barrier. Inside, the leader of the Shishi attack team, a Choshu youth called Saigo, glowered at the farmer, his wife, four children, father and mother, brother and a maid who knelt petrified, crowded into a corner. This was the only room and it served for living, eating, working, sleeping. A few scrawny chickens in a rafter cage clucked nervously. Remember what I told you. You know nothing. Have seen nothing. Yes, Lord, certainly, Lord, the old man whimpered. Shut up. Turn your backs, face the corner and close your eyes, all of you. Tie your sashes around your eyes. They obeyed. Instantly. Saigo was 18, tall and strongly built, with a rugged handsome face and he wore a short dark tunic and pantaloons similar to the samurai at the inn and two swords, straw sandals, no armor. When he was satisfied the peasants were blind as well as docile, he sat beside the door and peered out through rips in the window paper and began to wait. He could see the barrier and guard houses clearly. It was not yet sunset so the barrier was still open to latecomers. It had taken him and his men many days to find this place, ideal for their purposes. The back door led to a maze of alleys and paths, perfect for a sudden retreat. This afternoon, the moment the shogun's party had passed through the barrier, he had taken sudden possession. Footsteps. His hand readied his sword, then relaxed. Another youth came in silently, to be followed by another from a different direction. Soon seven more were within. Outside one stood guard, another at the corner of the alley that joined with the Tokaido, with an eleventh man, hiding in the village, to act as courier to gallop the glad tidings of success to Katsumata in Kyoto that would signal the attack on Agama and the gates. They were tough young men, dressed as he was without armor and identification, formerly Goshi, the lowest rank of samurai, now Ronin, all more or less the same age, 19-22. Only Saigo, 18, and Tora, 17, his Satsuma second in command, were younger. Drafts through rents in the window shivered them, that and their tension. With signs he motioned them to check their swords, shuriken and other lethal weapons, no need for words during the whole operation. As much as could be planned had been decided over the days. They all agreed it was to be conducted in silence. A glance out of the window. The sun was touching the horizon, sky clear. It was time. Solemnly he bowed to them and they bowed to him. He turned his attention back to the peasants. Three men will be outside, he said harshly. One rustle out of any of you until I get back and they'll fire the farm. Again the old man whimpered. Saigo gestured to the others. They followed him. So did the outside guard and the one on the corner. No turning back now. Those who were Buddhist had said a final prayer before a shrine, those who were Shinto had lit a last stick of incense and so joined their spirit with the thread of smoke that represented the fragility of life. All had written their death poems and sewn him to the breast of their tunics. Proudly they had given the correct fiefs, only the names were false. Once in the alley they split up into pairs, each taking an independent route. Soon they were in position, crouched down in the tall weeds and coarse vegetation beside the perimeter fence at the back of the inn, within sight of each other, Saigo at the southeast corner. The fence was three meters high and strongly made of giant bamboo and spiked at the top. By now shadows were losing form in the fading light, waiting, heartbeats heavy in their chests, palms sweaty, the slightest rustle an enemy patrol. Strange, strong taste in every mouth stabbing pains in the loins. Somewhere nearby a cricket began its urgent mating call, reminding Saigo of his death poem. A cricket with its joy-filled song. Dies quickly anyway. Better to be joy-filled than sad. He felt his eyes mist as the sky was misting. So beautiful to be so happy yet so sad. From inside the fence they could hear voices of servants, maids, occasionally samurai, and the clatter of metal dishes, for the kitchen area was not far away. In the distance a Samerson and the singer. Waiting. Sweat fell down Saigo's face. Then he heard the approaching, 
barely perceptible rustle of a kimono and a girl whisper, Blue Rainbow. Blue Rainbow. Then silence. Again sounds of the inn. At once he motioned to Tora, beside him. Silently this youth hurried to the other units and gave them the words and came back again. At Saigo's signal each pair found the ladders they had made, camouflaged and hidden in the wild undergrowth so carefully, set them against the fence. Again he watched the sky. As the last thread of sunlight went, another signal and they went up and over the fence as one man, jumping to the ground that was soft and tilled, crouching motionlessly in the meticulous shrubbery but ready for an instant frontal attack. Miraculously, no alarm yet. They looked up, warily. Ahead, sixty meters away, was the shogun's section, the thatched roofs showing just above the tall, thick hedge of hemlock, the roofs of the central sleeping section and bathhouses a little higher. The main entrance was well away from him, its doors still open. Everything exactly as they expected, except for the guards, many more than planned for. Bile jumped into their mouths. To their right were the main kitchens with great steaming cauldrons and massed staff, more guards there. Left and all around the compound were a scattering of guest cottages, in other gardens with streams and bridges, each with a well-tended entrance path curling through the shrubs. Silence there and no lights within, just one lantern at the front veranda. More anguish, they had expected him to be occupied and to serve as cover and a necessary diversion. Karma, Saigo thought. Even so our positions are as we predicted, so are those of the enemy, the plan is good and we know the password. During the previous two weeks, Disguised as an ordinary samurai traveler, he had found the correct courtesan and inveigled his way into her emotions so that soon he had been taken on a secret guided tour of the grounds, even to the places where the hallowed travelers were to rest. Why not? He had whispered. Who will know? They're not due here for days. Ah, you are so beautiful. Let us join where a shogun and a sister of the Son of Heaven will join. That will be something to whisper to our grandchildren, eh? I think I shall never leave you. It had been equally easy to find a bathhouse maid who was secretly fanatic for Shishi, and to persuade her there was no risk to listen and whisper a few words into the night. He felt Tora touch his arm. Anxiously the youth pointed. A patrol had come through the far gates. It began to circle the grounds. Small pools of light were beneath the lanterns. Inevitably the patrol would come this way and be very close. His signal, the call of a night bird, gave the order. At once they sank deeper into the foliage and kept their heads lowered, hardly breathing. The patrol approached, and then passed without seeing him, just as Katsumata had forecast when he had suggested their attack plan. Initially it will be easy to be missed in the dark. Never forget surprise is with you. Your infiltration will be totally unexpected. Who would dare to attack the Shogun when he is surrounded by so many men? At a way station, impossible. Remember, with stealth, surprise and ferocious speed two or three of you will reach the Colonel, and one is enough. Saigo watched the enemy marching away. A marvelous glow pervaded him and all his confidence returned. Another short wait until the enemy patrol had turned the corner, then he motioned for the attack teams to move into their predetermined positions. Protected from view by the shrubbery, four men slithered away to his right, two to his left. When all were in position, he took a deep breath to help slow his heartbeat. His signal, again the call of a night bird, gave the order to begin. At once the pair on his far right eased out of the shrubs onto the path, adjusting the ties on their pantaloons, and began strolling away, their arms around each other as lovers will. Within moments they had been noticed by the guards at the nearest hedge. You two, halt. The two youths obeyed and one called out, Blue Rainbow, Blue Rainbow, Lord Sergeant, and both laughed, pretending to be shy at being seen, then continued to stroll away, hand in hand. Halt. Who are you? Ah, so sorry, just friends on a nightly stroll, the youth said in his softest, most gentle voice. Blue Rainbow, have you forgotten our password? One of the samurai laughed and said, If the captain catches you, strolling, 
in the bushes around here you'll get more than a blue rainbow and both pairs of cheeks will know another type of beating. Again both youths pretended to laugh. Unhurried, they walked away, ignoring more strident calls to stop. Finally the sergeant shouted, you too, come here, at once. They faced him a moment, calling out plaintively there was no harm in what they were doing. Saigo and the others, covered by the diversion, had been crawling into final positions. Taught with excitement that they had not been noticed, they rested a second, knowing this diversion was almost over. The sound of the night bird Saigo made this time was loud enough to reach the two youths. Without hesitation, they pretended to laugh and ran off gaily, hand in hand, directly away from the guards as though playing a game. Their path carelessly took them through a pool of light and allowed them to be seen clearly for the first time. With a shout of rage the sergeant and four men charged in pursuit. Sentries at the far main gate peered into the darkness to see what was happening, and those guards at the hedge who could see beckoned others nearby, all of them alert. The two shishi were quickly surrounded. Back to back, swords ready, they stood silently at bay under a barrage of questions, nothing effeminate now in their stance or the way their lips were drawn back from the teeth. Enraged, the sergeant stepped forward a pace. The youth opposing him readied. His right hand darted into his sleeve and came out with a shuriken and before the sergeant could duck or move aside the five-pointed circle of steel was embedded in his throat and he fell burbling, choking in his own blood. Both Shishi leapt to the attack, but neither could break out of the net and though they fought bravely, wounding three of the samurai, they were no match for the others who, though wanting to disarm them and capture them alive, could not do so. One of the youths took a sword thrust through the lower part of his back and cried out, severely wounded but not enough to kill him immediately. The other whirled to his aid and in that instant was mortally wounded and crumpled, dying. Sono joy he gasped. Aghast, the other heard him, made one last impotent attempt to close with an attacker, then abruptly turned his sword on himself and fell on it. Find the captain, a samurai panted, blood streaming from a sword slash in his arm. One of the others ran off as the rest collected around the bodies, the sergeant still gurgling though dying fast. Nothing we can do for him. Never seen a shuriken so fast. Someone turned the two dead men over. Look, death poems. She she all right. E e e, both satsumas. They must have gone mad. Sono joy, another muttered. That's not mad. It's mad to say that aloud, a hard-faced Ashigaru warned him. If an officer hears you. Listen, these motherless dogs had the password, there's a traitor here. More nervously they looked at each other. Over on the right the kitchen staff were transfixed, not knowing what was going on. Many samurai had been drawn away from the hedge and stood gaping at the bodies, creating the opening Katsumata and Saigo had planned. Again Saigo signaled. His two strongest fighters broke out of the bushes on his extreme right and ran for the far southeast corner. Almost at once they were spotted. Cursing. The two nearest samurai rushed to intercept as others ran to their aid. Violent hand-to-hand -hand combat began again, darkness helping the attackers immeasurably. One defender screamed and went down clawing his half-severed arm. More samurai were drawn away from the hedge immediately in front of Saigo and just before the samurai overwhelmed the two fighters, in a coordinated maneuver the two shishi broke off the battle and pretended to flee pell-mell for the fence near the kitchens, well away from Saigo and the three final teams. As they fled they unwound ropes from their waists with small grapples on the end. Nearing the fence, they threw them deftly, caught the top, and began to climb, their pursuers redoubling their efforts. By now all attention was on these two. Guards near the entrance and the far side of the shogun's complex, Still not knowing exactly what was happening other than that two ronin were loose in the compound and were now trying to escape over the fence, hurried to intercept them. Others ran out and down the perimeter fence to catch them on that side. One of the shishi reached the top of the fence but before he could scramble over it a knife impaled him and he fell backwards into the shrubberies. The other man abandoned his rope, 
leapt beside his friend and just had time to see him bury his own knife in his throat to avoid capture before he went down under a flurry of blows. He twisted and turned and fought with great strength but was soon disarmed and pinioned to the earth by four samurai. Now, who are you? A samurai asked, out of breath. Who are you and what's your game? Sono joy, obey your emperor, the man panted, and again tried to fight out of the grip but could not. Others were collecting around him and he was confident he had done his part in the attack and could continue his diversion for a little while longer, unafraid of capture, because there was a poison vial in the neck of his kimono within reach of his teeth. I am Hiroshi Ashi of Tosa, and demand to see the shogun. From where he was hidden Saigo and the five men with him could hear their compatriot but their attention was fixed on the hedge facing them and on the far entrance. The few remaining guards left it to gather around the doomed man and now, at last, the target was open. Attack! The six men leapt to their feet and charged, Saigo and Tora leading the wedge. They had covered perhaps half the distance before there was a warning shout and samurai surrounding the bodies of the first team began running back to head him off. At once as she redoubled his efforts to escape, shouting and raving to distract those holding him but a fist smashed him into unconsciousness. You two stay here, the samurai panted, sucking his bruised knuckles. Don't kill the son of a dog, we'll need him alive. He got up painfully and limped off to join the others, a bad sword cut on his thigh. Some of the defenders were gaining on the six shishi who still ran directly at the hedge that curled away in both directions. Now, Saigo ordered. Immediately the pair to his right turned back into defensive positions, shurikens in their hands. Warily the running samurai slowed, darted left and right, fainted, then attacked, the shurikens finding targets but not wounding badly enough and another hand-to-hand -hand began, six samurai against the two of them. Reinforcements were running from the main gate, others from the first diversion, all of them, defenders and attackers, converging on their lodestar, the gateway to the shogun's lair. When the men from the inn's main gate saw to their horror that the hedges and entrance had been left completely unguarded, though the doors were closed, with Saigo and three others running fast and not far from the hedge, they swung away to position themselves between the shishi and the entrance, leaving others to attack them, and frantically raced to protect the gate. Behind Saigo and Tora the two fighters were attacking, retreating, still covering their rear. Both men had sustained wounds but two samurai were on the ground, writhing with pain. Four against two with others not far away. Now, Saigo ordered, and the pair on his left broke away and stabbed for the entrance. No doubt they would reach it before the defenders and this caused others heading for Saigo also to change direction and make for the entrance as well. At once Saigo and Tora whirled and joined the fight behind them. Their ferocious charge dispatched two of the remaining four samurai and helped eliminate the remaining enemy. Only Saigo and Tora, though breathing heavily, were untouched. At once Saigo ordered, go. The two men sang out, sono joy, and, painfully, rushed to support the attack on the entrance, drawing off more samurai, leaving Saigo and Tora to resume their headlong charge for the hedge. The first pair of shishi attacking the gateway reached the narrow path and ran for the doors. One man began to push them open. At that moment an arrow thwacked viciously into the wood and then both men were hit and shortly riddled with more arrows from bowmen amongst the reinforcements. They cried out, impotently tried to continue, and died on their feet. The second team gained the pathway. One rushed at the oncoming samurai, the other went for the gates, stumbled over his dead comrades, and died, pierced with four arrows. His friend hit the samurai head-on, and was quickly killed. Only minutes had passed since the beginning. Now the way was open to the pathway. In moments the fleetest of the defenders would reach the entrance and then there would be no way that Saigo and Tora, almost at the end of their run and due to turn for the gateway, could reach their goal. So the pace of the defenders slackened, the bowmen took aim leisurely, confident of victory. To their astonishment, instead of wheeling along the hedge, Saigo and Tora kept the straight line of their rush and hurled themselves forward at the hedge, 
side by side. Their momentum caused them to burst through it, that and the accuracy of their leap. Over preceding days, Saigo found that though the branches were tightly interwoven, the trunks of the trees were about half a meter apart, and, he had surmised, if judged correctly, a rush would carry him through. It did, successfully, though the branches lashed them bloodily around the face and arms. The two men picked themselves up exactly where Saigo had planned, on the meandering path beside the veranda that led to the bathhouse. For a moment no one was in sight, then several terrified maids and servants gaped at him from a doorway and vanished. Saigo led the soundless dash down the path and up the steps and around the veranda corner. Two anxious officials came out of nowhere, unarmed and unprepared, one of them the chamberlain. Saigo cut both down, killing the chamberlain instantly, and wounding the other, and charged onwards. Tora finished off this man, jumped over the bodies and rushed in pursuit. Along the veranda and around the corner and smashing through the light shoji screen, they burst into the bathhouse. Half-naked maids stared at them panic-stricken, swords bloody, faces scratched and bloody, kimonos ripped and bloody. The air was warm, sweet-smelling, humid. Saigo bellowed with rage. The steaming, shallow bath, fed from a natural hot spring, was empty, so were the four wooden steam boxes, and so were the massage tables, except one. In an instant he saw every detail of the tiny naked girl lying there, the shock in her eyes, her half-opened mouth, teeth blackened, her plume of jet hair twisted into a stark white towel, more towels under her, small breasts and limbs and feet, dark brown nipples, all of her curved, inviting, golden skin now pinkish from the heat of the bath, oiled and fragrant, and the blind, half-naked masseurs, standing motionlessly over her, head cocked, listening intently. So easy to kill the girl and all of them, but his orders were not to harm the princess at all costs. Nonetheless his fury at being cheated, for their timing had been perfect, their intelligence perfect and the shogun's pattern never varying, made his head seem about to explode. The fury turned to lust and shivered him, all of him wanting her, now, fast, brutally, anyway, the wife before the husband, death to both of them but first her splayed. His lips came away from his teeth and he charged across the expanse. The maids scattered, one fainted, the princess gasped and lay motionless, petrified. But his obsession with the shogun diverted him and his rush bypassed her and took him to the shoji door where again he crashed through and, once more, with Tora close behind, unerringly led the run along verandas towards the sleeping quarters and his prey, gardens to his right, rooms left, no longer a thinking man just a raging killing animal. Shoji doors were open, faces there. Maids and youths and ladies in waiting and servants attracted by the commotion, dressed or half-dressed for the evening or for bed or for bath, gaped at them. No guards in these rooms. Yet, still no opposition. Yet, a few more rooms to pass, doors, faces, and then he would turn the last corner and last veranda. Saigo's anticipation crested, for this was a delightful covered walkway, gardens right and left, no more rooms with waiting guards to worry about, and at the end the shogun's sleeping quarters where he himself and the courtesan had secretly bedded. All senses tuned for expected danger, Tora a few paces behind him, running as fast, sounds of men approaching, pounding feet. Another room passed, only one more doorway, last danger. Faces at the door, a doctor and a coughing youth stared at him in shock, then he was around the corner, and together they began the last charge. Both men skidded to a stop. Their hearts stopped. Ahead an officer and three samurai came out of the sanctuary door, swords drawn, to stand waiting for them. The barest hesitation, then Saigo rushed to the kill, his or theirs, Tora equally committed, only these four men between them and the shogun they protected. Sono joy. The captain held the first charge, parried the blow and locked sword to sword, then twisted and hacked at Saigo as two other samurai attacked Tora, the last staying in reserve as ordered. 
Saigo deflected the blow and slashed back but missed. Another ferocious flurry of blow and counterblow, Saigo supremely confident, so near to success, pressing the attack, feeling superhuman and that his blade, almost of its own volition, was seeking enemy flesh as it would in seconds destroy the boy shogun. There was a blinding flash behind his eyes, the pounding in his head soared and he suddenly saw that doctor again and that boy again and remembered someone telling him it was believed the boy shogun had a hacking cough. No portraits of him, of course, not one of the shishi ever having seen him, of course. If you do not catch him in the bathhouse, Katsumata had said, you will recognize him by his blackened teeth, the cough, his nearness to the princess, the quality of his robes. Remember, both he and the princess detest guards nearby. With enormous, heightened strength, howling like a wild beast, Saigo hacked at the captain, who slipped on the polished floor and was, for an instant, helpless. But Saigo did not deliver the death blow, instead whirled back for the boy, and the last samurai saw the opening he had been ordered to wait for. His sword went deep into Saigo's side, but Saigo felt none of it and cut impotently at the shogun wraith in front of him again and once again and slid to the floor stabbing, already dead, but not knowing it. The captain had leapt to his feet and hurtled to the attack on Tora, impaled him, and then like an expert butcher withdrew the blade and beheaded him with a single blow. Do the same to him, he gasped, pointing at Saigo, his chest heaving as he tried to regain his breath, and rushed back up the veranda. At the corner, men from the entranceway came pounding up, headed by his second-in-command. He cursed him and them, shoved him out of the way and hurried past saying, every man on this shift ordered to the square outside the inn, disarmed and on their knees. You too, his heart was still pounding and he was enraged and not yet over his panic. Just before sunset Nobusada had testily sent for him, take all guards from inside the hedge. Ridiculous to have them here, the room's so small and awful. Are you helpless, so inept you can't secure this nasty little inn? Must we bathe with guards, sleep with guards, eat with them looking at us? Go away, tonight I forbid all guards here. But, sire, I must inns. You will insist on nothing. No guards inside the hedge tonight. This meeting is ended, there was nothing the captain could do, but then there was no need to worry. Of course everything was secure. When the first muffled sounds of the attack had reached him he was making a final, satisfactory circuit inside the hedge, four men with him, the hedge also acting as a fine sound barrier. By the time he had reached the gate doors and looked out, he had been appalled to see four men charging the hedge, two rushing for the gates. His first thought was for the shogun and he ran for the bathhouse but the chamberlain had called out, what's going on? Men are attacking us get the shogun out of the bath. He's not there, he's with the doctor. Another panic dash, bypassing the bathhouse to the inner quarters, finding him empty, a frightened maid saying that the lord shogun was in one of the rooms on the next veranda and then coming out and seeing the two men charging, no way to protect the shogun now but thinking if these two were attacking here perhaps they had missed his liege lord. He knew he would not truly be alive until he found him alive. This took no time. Nobusada was coughing and raving, still in fright, others around him adding to the tumult. Quickly he learned the princess was unharmed though also hysterical. His panic left him. He disregarded Nobusada's rage, his voice icy, and every soldier nearby quailed. Get a courier and four men on the double to rush a report ahead and except for this present shift, all guards here on the double, Every man within the compound, fifty men around the sleeping quarters, two men at each corner of every veranda, and ten men permanently in sight of the Lord Shogun until he and she are safely within the palace walls. In mid-morning the next day, within the palace walls, Yoshi hurried through the outer rim of gardens in the light rain. General Akeda was beside him. This is terribly dangerous, sire, he said, afraid that every shrub or thicket, however carefully tended, might hide enemies. Both men wore light armor and swords, a rarity here where all samurai and all weapons were forbidden, 
except for the ruling shogun and an immediate guard of four, the leader of the elders and guardian of the heir. It was almost noon. The two men were late and noticed none of the beauty surrounding them. Lakes and bridges and flowering shrubs and trees groomed and cherished over centuries. Whenever a gardener saw them, the man would kowtow until they were out of sight. Over their armor was straw overmantels against the rain. All morning there had been intermittent showers. Yoshi's pace quickened. This was not the first time he had hurried to a clandestine meeting within the palace grounds. Safe, but never truly safe. So difficult to have a truly safe meeting anywhere with a spy, informer, or adversary. In secret, almost impossible. Always afraid of ambush, poison, or hidden bowmen or musketeers. The same applied to every daimyo. His own safety factor, he knew, was very low. So low, in fact, that his father and grandfather had taught him to accept the fact that death from old age had no place in their karma. We are as safe as anywhere on earth, he said. It would be unthinkable to break a truce here. Yes, except for Agama. He is a liar, cheat. He should be meat for vultures. His head spiked. Yoshi smiled and felt better. Since the appalling news of the Shishi attack had arrived in the middle of the night, he had been more on edge than ever. More than when, on the death of his uncle, he had been passed over as shogun and Nobusada appointed instead. More than when Tyro E had arrested him, his father and their families, and sent him to rot in foul quarters. He had made preparations to rush 200 men to meet the entourage at the Kyoto barrier, and at dawn had sent Akeda secretly to Agama to relate what had happened and why a large party of men equipped for war were leaving his stockade. Tell Agama all that we have been told, and answer any of his questions. I want no mistakes, Akeda. There will be none from me, sire. Good. Then give him the letter and request an immediate answer. Yoshi had not told Akeda what the letter contained, nor did his general ask. And when Akeda returned, Yoshi said, "Tell me exactly what he did." Agama read the letter twice and spat, cursed twice, threw it at his counselor Basuhiro, who read it with that stony, slimy, pockmarked face of his that gave nothing away, who said, "Perhaps we should discuss this in private, sire." I told them I would wait. I did, and then, after a reasonable time, Basuhiro came out and said, "My lord agrees, but he will come armed, and I will be armed." What's this all about, sire? Yoshi told him, and the old man went purple. You asked to meet him alone, with only myself as guard. That is craziness. Just because he says he will come only with Basuhi. Enough. Yoshi knew the risks were great, but he had to gamble again. Had to have an answer on his proposal about the gates, and then, when he was about to leave, and one of the surfeit of shogunate spies reported certain conversations overheard between the Shishi Katsumata and others at the Inn of Whispering Pines, he had been elated. He had asked for the meeting. There he is. Agama was standing in the shade of a wide branch tree where they had agreed. Basuhiro at his side. Both were clearly suspicious, expecting treachery. But not as visibly nervous as Akeda. Yoshi had proposed that Agama come in through the south gate. He would use the east gate, leaving his palanquin and guards outside with their safe conduct guaranteed. After the meeting, all four would walk out of the east gate together. As before, the two adversaries walked towards each other to speak alone. Akeda and Basuhiro watched tensely. So Agama said after their formal greeting. A handful of shishi attack through hundreds of guards like a knife through dung, and almost in Nobusada's bath, naked wife and bed before their court. Ten men, you say? Three were Choshu Ronan. The two that got through the hedge were Choshus, one of them the leader. Yoshi was not over his fright at the attack, and wondered if he dared draw his sword at this rare opportunity to challenge Agama alone. Basuhiro presented no physical threat. With or without Akeda, I need Agama dead one way or another. He thought, but not yet. Not when two thousand Choshu hold the gates and me in thrall. All of them died without doing harm, except to some guards, the survivors not long on this earth. I hear you have offered all your Choshu Ronan an amnesty. He asked, 
his voice edging, wondering again if Agama had a secret hand in the planning, which had been impeccable and, if the truth were known, should have been successful. If she she or not. Yes, Agama said, his mouth smiling. All daimyo should do the same, a quick and simple way to control all ronin, she she or not. They are a pestilence that must be stopped. I agree, amnesty will not stop them. May I ask, how many of your ronin have accepted your offer? Agama laughed roughly, clearly not the ones who were in the attack. One or two so far, Yoshi Dono. How many are there in all? A hundred, not two hundred, of which twenty or thirty may be Choshu. Choshu or not, never mind. His face hardened. I did not plan the attack if that is what is in your mind, or know about it. The mirthless smile returned. Unthink able to have such a treasonous thought. A. Eh? Easy to stamp Shishi out if you and I wanted to. But their slogan is not as easy to suppress, if indeed it should be suppressed. Power should return to the Emperor, Gai Jin should be expelled. Sono Joy is a good slogan, eh? I could say many things, Agama Dono, but allies should not bait one another. We are allies, you agree? Agama nodded. In principle, yes. Good, Yoshi said, hiding his astonishment that Agama had agreed to his conditions. Within the year you are chief of the elders. From noon I garrison the gates. He turned to go. Everything as you said, except the gates. The vein in Yoshi's forehead knotted. But I said I need the gates. So sorry. Agama's hand had not tightened on his sword though his feet had shifted into a better fighting stance. Secret allies, yes, war with Tosa, yes, with Satsuma, yes, the gates, no. So sorry. For a moment Yoshi Toranana said nothing. He looked at him. Agama stared back unafraid, waiting, ready to fight if need be. Then Yoshi sighed, white raindrops from the edge of his wide-brimmed hat. I want to be allies. Allies should help one another. I have a compromise, perhaps, but first I give you some special information. Katsumata is here in Kyoto. The blood rushed into Agama's face. Not possible. My spies would have told me. He is here and has been here for some weeks. There are none of Sanjiro's men in Kyoto, least of all that man. My spies would have tea. Ah, sorry, Yoshi said softly. He is here, secretly, not as Sanjiro's pathfinder and spy, at least not openly. Katsumata is Shishi, a sensei of Shishi, and the leader of Shishi here, codenamed the Raven. Agama gaped at him. Katsumata is the Shishi leader. Yes, and a little more. Think for a moment. Is he not Sanjiro's most trusted, longtime counselor and tactician? Did he outsmart you on behalf of Sanjiro with his false pact and foil you at Fushimi and allow Sanjiro to escape? Does that not mean Sanjiro of Satsuma is secretly the real leader of Shishi and that all of their assassinations are part of his general plan to overthrow all of us, you particularly, to become Shogun? That's always been Sanjiro's goal, of course, Agama said, momentarily glazed, many hitherto unexplained occurrences now falling into place. If he controls all Shishi too, he stopped, suddenly infuriated that Takeda had never told him. Why, is Takeda not a spy for me, not a true secret vassal after all? Where is Katsumata now? One of your patrols almost ambushed him at the Inn of Whispering Pines a few days ago. Again color came into Agama's face and he almost spat. He was there. We heard that Shishi was sleeping there but I never knew. Once again he choked with rage that Takeda had not forewarned him that his hated enemy was within his grasp. Why, never mind, easy to deal with Takeda. First Katsumata. I have not forgotten Katsumata ruined my surprise attack on Sanjiro. But for Katsumata, Sanjiro would be dead, I would be overlord of Satsuma, and there would be no need to talk with Toranunga Yoshi, he would be on his knees in front of me. Where is he now? Do you know where? I know the safe house where he was last night, perhaps tonight too. Yoshi added softly, there are over a hundred shishi in Kyoto. 
They already plan a mass attack on you. Agama felt chilled, knowing there was no true defense against a fanatic assassin not afraid to die. When? It was to be at dusk tomorrow, if the attack on the Shogun had been successful. Then, once you were dead, with adherence amongst your troops, they would seize the gates. It took much of Agama's strength not to tell Yoshi a secret meeting with Takeda was due at dusk tomorrow, a perfect moment for a surprise attack. And now that it was a failure, the information I have is that the leaders are meeting tonight to decide. Now, formally, you head their target list, after Nobusada and myself. Why? Agama spluttered. I support the Emperor, support the fight against the Gai Jin. Yoshi kept the smile off his face, knowing very well. Let us join forces tonight. I know their meeting place, where Katsumata and most of the leaders should be. There is a dawn to dusk curfew in that part of the city. Agama exhaled. And the price? First, here is more information that seriously affects both of us. To Agama's further disquiet, Yoshi related the details of the elders meeting with Sir William and the other ministers, about his spy Misumoto, about Sir William's threat to make an armed sortie here as soon as his fleet returned, and how the threat and payment had been finessed for the moment. Their fleet will not pass my Shimonoseki Straits, if I order it. They could take the long route around South Island. Long route, short route, it makes no difference. If they land in or near Osaka, I, or we, will destroy them. The first time, with great losses but, yes, Gai Jin will be repulsed. However, two days ago I received a secret report from the department of the Bakufu here who deal with China information. He brought out the scroll. Here, read it for yourself. What does it say? Agama snapped. That the Yokohama fleet sent to punish the sinking of just one British ship devastated 20 leagues of China's coastline, north of Shanghai, burning all villages, sinking all shipping. Agama spat. Pirates. Pirate nests. He knew much about that area. In the past it had been historic, though secret Choshu, and Satsuma, policy to send raiders to the China coast to pillage ruthlessly from Shanghai, southwards beyond Hong Kong to the Taiwan Straits. The Chinese called them Wako, pirates, hating and fearing them so much that, for centuries, Emperors of China have forbidden any Japanese from landing on their shores, and all trade between their lands was to be conducted only by non-Japanese. Pirates, yes, but those scum are not cowards. Not so long ago an army of these same Gaijin humbled all China a second time and burned the Emperor's summer palace and Peking at their whim. Their fleets and armies are awesome in power. This is Nippon, not China. Agama shrugged not prepared to be drawn out or to divulge his plans for the defense of Choshu. But he was thinking, my coasts are rugged and rock-infested, difficult to invade and very defensible, soon impregnable when all armed emplacements are in place, and bunkers for my fighters. And we are not Chinese. My thought is that we need peace between all daimyos to gain time, to manipulate Gaijin, to learn their cannon secrets and gun secrets and ship secrets and how it seems this one foul little island, smaller than our land, has become the wealthiest in the world and rules most of it. Lies. Lies spread to frighten cowards here. Yoshi shook his head. I do not believe that. First we must learn, then we can smash them. We cannot now. We can. This is the land of the gods. In Choshu I have one cannon factory, soon there will be others. Satsuma has three small steamers, the beginnings of a shipyard, soon there will be others. His face twisted. We can smash Yokohama and this fleet and by the time others return we will be ready. Yoshi hid his surprise at the vehemence and strength of the hatred, secretly elated he had smoked out another weapon to use. I agree. My whole point. There, you see, Agama Dono, he said as though greatly relieved, we think the same though perhaps from different points. We smash them but in time, we must choose the time, gain their knowledge and let them give us the means to spike their guns and their heads. His voice firmed. In one year you and I control the council and. Bakufu. In three or four we can buy many guns, 
cannon and ships. Paid for how? Gai Jin are greedy. One way is coal for their ships. Another is gold. Yoshi explained his prospecting scheme. Clever, Agama said. His lips twisted into a strange smile. In Choshu we have coal, iron and trees for ships. And one armament factory already. Agama laughed, a good laugh, and Yoshi laughed too and knew he had made a breakthrough. True, and my batteries increase monthly. Agama shifted his overmantle under the increasing rain and added pointedly, so does my resolve to fire on enemy shipping, when I wish. Is that all your information, Yoshi Dono? For the moment, may I advise you to slacken your grip on the straits, in any event they are yours to play with. Yes, that's all for the moment, but as an ally you will be given all kinds of privileged information. As an ally I would expect privileged information. Agama nodded half to himself. He glanced back at Basuhiro then changed his mind about consulting him. Yoshi is right, he thought, leaders should have secrets. We have talked enough. Katsumata, I ask the price. A joint attack tonight. What would a very particular ally offer? Agama stretched to ease the grinding tension in his neck and shoulders, expecting the question, for all his bravado no fool. Time enough to vary an offer, he thought, though neither of us would ever deign to lose face by bartering like the despised Osaka rice merchants. You can garrison the gates for one month, twenty men only at each of the six gates, two hundred of my men stationed nearby, Agama smiled, not near enough to embarrass you. Any persons going in or out will receive permits from your officer of the gates, as is correct, who will have quietly and previously consulted with my, my liaison officer before permits are granted. Consult, consult, as between privileged allies, so a consensus can easily be arrived at. The easy smile was gone. If more than twenty of your men appear, my men take possession and all agreements are ended. Agreed. Yoshi's eyes had flattened. No need to make threats, obviously any trick on either side would end all agreements. I would prefer forty men at each of the gates, we can arrange details of how the guard changes without problem, and I garrison the gates as long as Shogun Nobusada and the Princess Yazu are inside. Agama had noted the change. Shogun Nobusada, yes, but not the princess who, who may stay inside permanently, eh? Forty. Very well, forty at each gate. Of course, her brother, the son of heaven, will not rescind his memorial, his request to me to hold the gates against his enemies. The son of heaven is the son of heaven. But I doubt if a cancellation would be forthcoming while shogunate forces exercise their historic rights. At once Agama's expression was naked. Let you and I forget this polite back and forth and speak plainly, I'll concede a face-saving device on the gates in return for Katsumata and all the rest. Your men become the honor guard, your banners can be there and I agree with a lot you said, yes, much of it, but I do not concede my opposition to, historic rights, or to the shogunate or Bakufu, he stopped, and because he really wanted what was offered, he made another concession, to the present shogunate and Bakufu, Yoshi Dono. Please excuse my bluntness. It would be good to be allies. I did not expect it would be possible or that I could agree to anything. Yoshi nodded, hiding his glee. I am happy we can agree and I tell you bluntly too we can agree to major changes, and little ones. For example, he added lightly, if such a memorial arrived from the emperor, it would be a forgery. Now Agama's smile was genuine and he felt he had achieved a perfect compromise. Good. And now Katsumata. The attack on the Shishi hideaway began a few hours before dawn. Surprise was perfect. Katsumata, all subleaders, and others were inside. And Sumomo. The first moment the two lookouts became aware of danger was when, just down the alley, muddy from the rain, one of the hovels burst into flames to muffled cries of alarm from the occupants and close neighbors. At once these men and women, all secret Bakufu plants, began to crowd the alley in pretended panic, the diversion helping to cover the stealthy approach of the attacking force. As the sentries went to investigate, 
Arrows came out of the night and cut him down. One of them howled an alarm before he died. At once the main force swarmed out of the night to surround this whole section of slum dwellings. Most of the men were agamas, at his request, Yoshi had agreed, saying that he would send a token 40 hand-picked men, under Akeda. In moments many of the assault group had lit torches. These partially illuminated the target hut, back and front, and a fusillade of arrows went into every opening and weak spot. Then, unexpectedly, the four Yoshi riflemen ran into position, two at the back of the huts and two in the front, and fired several volleys through the paper walls. For an instant there was a stunned silence, samurai, shishi, and all nearby slum dwellers equally shocked, the sound of rapid firing unheard of. Then the silence broke as everyone but the assault group scattered for cover, and screams and shouts came from the wounded within. A hut adjoining the first blaze caught fire and this fire spread rapidly next door and next door and next door until both sides of the far end of the alley became an inferno, trapping many a family inside. The Agama captain leading the raid paid no attention to that hazard, which only threatened inhabitants, but ordered the first attack wave in, disregarding Yoshi's advice to torch the hovels and let his riflemen pick off the shishi as they broke from cover. Four Agama attackers fell under a vicious shishi sally from the front door and side windows. A general fight erupted both here and in the back alley as another furious foray was contained, men flailing, hampered by the confined space and mud and semi-darkness. Two men breached the cordon to be cut down by others waiting in ambush. Another volley into the hovel was followed by another attempted breakout by a frantic group of shishi, a helpless mission as another circle awaited them beyond and then another. Smoke from the fires began to hinder attackers and the attacked. An order from Akeda. His men with torches rushed close to the hovel and hurled them onto the roof or through the shojis, swiftly retreating to give a clear field to their comrades with rifles. More firing and more deaths as another cluster of shishi rushed out to join the shouting, screaming melee. The stench of smoke and offal and blood and fire and burning flesh and death began to fill the damp night. The rain turned to drizzle. Well protected by personal guards, Agama and Yoshi were watching from a command position away from the blaze and fighting. Both wore armor and swords and Yoshi had his rifle slung. Beside them were some Bakufu officials. In the raging confusion, they were surprised to see a shishi dart through the cordon and run up the alley, escaping into a side alley obscured from attacking Choshu samurai. Is that Katsumata? Agama called out, but his words were drowned as, without hesitation, Yoshi had aimed and fired and loaded and fired again. The man went down screaming, Agama and everyone nearby recoiling at the suddenness, not expecting Yoshi to become personally involved. Taking his time, Yoshi aimed again at the man squirming helplessly in the dirt. The bullet shoved the body backwards. A final tortured howl and it became inert. That is not Katsumata, Yoshi said, disappointedly. Agama cursed, his night vision not good. He pulled his eyes off the body and looked at the rifle, loose in Yoshi's hands, repressing a shudder. You use that well. It is easy to learn, Agama dono, too easy. With careful nonchalance, Yoshi put another shell into the breach, fairly sure that this would be the first rifle Agama had seen. He had brought it and his rifleman deliberately to impress him, to keep him off balance, and make him more wary about trying any assassination attempts. To kill like this is disgusting, cowardly, dishonorable. Yes, yes, it is. May I see the gun, please? Of course. Yoshi put on the safety catch. It's American, the very latest breech loader. I take delivery of 5,000 shortly. His smile was thin, remembering he had usurped a gamma's order. My ancestor was wise to outlaw all guns. Anyone can use one of these to kill, close up or from a distance, daimyo, merchant, robber, ronin, peasant, woman, child. My ancestor was very wise. A pity we cannot do the same but Gai Jin have made it impossible. The rifle felt strange to Agama, heavier than a sword, oiled and deadly, and this added curiously to the excitement of the raid, 
The killing and screams and battle and knowing that spies had reported Katsumata was truly inside so, soon now, his hated enemy's head would be on display. All this filled him with an untoward sick sweet nausea. Good to kill like that without danger to yourself, he told himself, his fingers caressing the barrel, but Yoshi is right again. In the wrong hands, all other hands would be wrong. Five thousand, eee, -e -e, that would make him very difficult to fight. I only ordered two hundred and fifty. Where is he getting the money? His lands are almost as debt-ridden as mine. Ah yes, I forgot, bartering mining concessions. Clever, I will do the same. What is his secret plan? Does he have a crimson sky, too? If Yoshi gets five thousand I must get ten. Tonight he brought forty men. Why forty? Was that to remind me I agreed to forty at each gate? Forty riflemen could easily decimate my two hundred unless equally armed. You have more here? He asked. Yoshi decided to be open. Not at the moment. Thoughtfully Agama handed the rifle back and turned his attention to the hovels. The sounds of the battle were lessening, those of the fires increasing, more and more inhabitants trying to douse them in lines passing water buckets. Roofs of the target hut and those each side were burning now. There was another desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat as more Shishi left the burning hovel, many already wounded. Yoshi said, Katsumata's not amongst them. Perhaps he tried to break out from the back. There, out of their sight, five Shishi were already dead in the dirt together with eight Agama samurai, and six wounded. Another battle between three Shishi and ten Agama samurai was drawing to its inevitable conclusion. A final shout of, Sono Joy, and the three men rushed to their deaths. Thirty Choshu samurai were arranged in depth, waiting for the next breakout. Smoke billowed from rips in the shojis. Stench of burning flesh was on the air. No movement from inside. An officer motioned to one of the samurai. Report to the captain what occurred here and ask him, do we wait or go in? The man ran off. In front, the skirmish ended as all the others had done. The three Shishi died bravely. Twelve more of them dead here, seventeen Choshu samurai and one of Yoshi's men scattered in heaps. Fourteen wounded, three Shishi helpless, disarmed and still alive. The captain listened to the report. Tell the officer to wait and kill anyone we flush out. He called out to a group held in reserve. Empty the huts while there is time. Kill anyone who will not surrender but not the wounded. At once the men went for the door. Inside there were brief shouts and counter shouts and then silence. One of the men came out again, blood pouring from a vicious cut in his thigh. Half a dozen wounded, many bodies. Bring him out before the roof falls in. The bodies, and wounded, were lined up in front of Yoshi and Agama, the officials nearby. Torches cast strange shadows. Twenty-nine dead. Eleven helplessly wounded. Katsumata was not amongst them. Where is he? Agama shouted at the chief official, enraged, Yoshi equally angry, no one knowing exactly how many enemy were within when the battle had begun. The man went to his knees. Sire, I swear he was there earlier and he never left. Agama stomped over to the nearest wounded Shishi. Where is he? The man glared at him through his pain. Who? Katsumata. Katsumata. Who? I know no. No Katsumata. Sono joy. Traitor. Kill me and have done with it. Soon enough, Agama said through his teeth. Each of the wounded was questioned. Agama had looked into every face. No Katsumata. Or Takeda. Kill them all. Let them die honorably, as samurai, Yoshi said. Of course. They both looked back as the roof of the hut fell in and the walls collapsed in a shower of sparks, carrying the adjoining hovels with it. The drizzle turned to rain again. Captain, put the fire out. There must be a cellar, a hiding place, if this piece of dung is not an incompetent fool. Agama strode off, in total rage, believing somehow he had been cheated. Nervously the chief official got off his knees and sidled nearer to Yoshi. Excuse me, sire, he whispered, but the woman's not here either. There must be a h. What woman? She was young, a satsuma. 
She has been with him for some weeks. We believe she was Katsumata's companion. I am sorry to say Takeda is not there either. Who? A Choshu Shishi we have been watching. Perhaps he was Agama's spy he was seen sneaking into Agama's headquarters the day before our other attack on Katsumata failed. For certain Katsumata was in there and the other two. Certain, sire. All three, sire. Then there is a cellar or secret escape route. They found it in the dawn. A trapdoor over a narrow tunnel, just enough to crawl through that ended well away in a weed-covered garden of an empty shack. Furiously Agama kicked the camouflaged cover. Barker, we will put a price on Katsumata's head. A special price, Yoshi said. He was as angry. Obviously the failure had bruised the relationship so agonizingly manipulated and begun. But he was too shrewd to mention Takeda, or about the woman, she had no significance. Katsumata must still be in Kyoto. The Bakufu will be ordered to find him, capture him or bring us his head. My adherents will be ordered the same. Agama was a little mollified. He also had been thinking about Takeda, wondering if his escape boded good or bad. He glanced at the captain who had walked up. Yes. You wish to view the heads now, sire? Yes. Yoshi Dono. Yes. The wounded Shishi were allowed to die honorably without further pain. They were ritually decapitated, their heads washed and were now in a formal row. Forty. Again that number, Agama thought uneasily. Is that an omen? Nonetheless he hid his disquiet, recognizing none of them. I have seen him, he said formally, the dawn misted with the light rain. I have seen him, Yoshi said equally gravely. Put the heads on spikes, twenty outside my gates, and twenty outside Lord Yoshi's. And the sign, sire, the captain asked. Yoshi Dono, what do you suggest? After a pause, knowing he was being tried again, Yoshi said, the two signs could read. These outlaws, Ronan, were punished for crimes against the emperor. Let all beware misdeeds. Is that satisfactory? Yes. And the signature, both of them knew this was highly important and difficult to solve. If Agama signed it alone, that implied he was legally master of the gates. If Yoshi, that would imply Agama was subservient to him, legally true but out of the question. A Bakufu seal implied the same. A court seal would be undue meddling in temporal matters. Perhaps we give these fools too much importance, Yoshi said, pretending contempt. His eyes narrowed as, over Agama's shoulder, he saw Basuhiro and some guards come around the far corner of the mean, puddled alley at a run. He looked back at Agama. Why not just put their heads on spikes here? Why give them the honor of a sign? Those who we want to know will know soon enough, and be chastened. Nay, Agama was pleased with the diplomatic solution. Excellent. I agree. Let us meet at dusk and he stopped as he noticed Basuhiro hurrying up to them, sweating and out of breath. He went to meet him. Courier from Shimonoseki, sire, Basuhiro panted. Agama's face became a mask. He took the scroll and moved nearer to one of the torches. All eyes were on him as he opened it, Basuhiro politely holding an umbrella over him. The message was from the captain commanding the straits and dated eight days ago, Courier de Express, day and night, as highest priority. Sire, yesterday the returning enemy fleet consisting of the flagship and seven other warships, all steamers, some towing coaling barges, entered the straits. Following your instructions that we should not engage enemy warships without your written orders we let them pass. We could have sunk all of them. Our Dutch advisers confirm this. When the armada had passed, a steamer frigate flying a French flag arrogantly returned and fired broadside after broadside into four emplacements on the east end of the straits, destroying them and their cannon, then steamed away. Again I refrained from retaliating in accordance with your orders. If attacked in future I request permission to sink the attacker. Death to all Gai Jin, Agama wanted to scream, blind with rage that a whole fleet had been within his grasp, like Katsumata but had escaped vengeance, like Katsumata. Flecks of foam collected at the corners of his lips. Prepare new instructions. 
engage and destroy any and all enemy warships. Basuhiro, still trying to catch his breath, said, May I suggest, sire, you consider, if more than four at any one time. You have always wanted to maintain surprise. Agama wiped his mouth and nodded, his heart pumping at the thought of so many ships he could have destroyed. The rain had increased and was drumming on the umbrella. Beyond Basuhiro he saw Yoshi and the other officers waiting, watching him, and he weighed whether to treat Yoshi as enemy or ally, the implications of the fleet, the arrogance, and his own impotence swamping him. Yoshi Dono, he beckoned him and, with Basuhiro, moved further into private. Read it, please. Yoshi read rapidly. In spite of his control the color left his face. Is the fleet heading up the inland sea for Osaka? Or will they turn south for Yokohama? South or not, the next warships in my waters get blown out of my waters. Basuhiro, send men at once to Osaka and... Wait, Agama Dono, Yoshi said quickly, wanting time to think. Basuhiro, what is your counsel? The little man said at once, Sire, for the moment I presume it is Osaka and we should, together, prepare at once to defend it. I have already sent spies urgently to discover the fleet's course as best I can. Good, Agama shakily wiped rain out of his face. Their whole fleet in my straits. I should have been there. Basuhiro said, It is more important for you to guard the emperor against his enemies, sire, and your commander was correct not to fire on the single ship. Surely it was a decoy to smell out your strength. He was right not to give away your defenses. Now the trap is baited should you wish to close it. Because only one enemy warship sneaked back and bombarded some easy positions and left hastily, I surmise their fleet commander was afraid, was not prepared to attack or land troops to start the war that we will end. Yes, we will. A ruse. I agree. Yoshi Dono, Agama said with finality, we should have done with it and start the war. A surprise attack on Yokohama, if they land at Osaka or not. Yoshi could not answer at once, almost sick with a sudden apprehension that he tried to hide. Eight warships. That's four more than sailed to China, so the Gai Jin have reinforced their fleet. Why? To retaliate for the Satsuma murders, but more particularly, Agama's attacks on their shipping. And they will do it as in China. The Gai Jin ship was sunk in the Taiwan Straits, but they decimated China's coast hundreds of leagues away. What is their easiest target in Nippon? Yedo. Has Agama realized this and his secret plan is just to provoke the Gai Jin? If I were the Gai Jin leader I would destroy Yedo. They do not know it but Yedo is indivisible from our shogunate. If Yedo ends, the Toranunga shogunate ends and then the land of the gods is open to rape. Therefore this will be prevented at all costs. Think, how to bottle the Gai Jin, and Agama, whose answer is to put our heads on their block, not his. I agree with your wise counselor, we should prepare to defend Osaka, he began, his stomach churning. Then his anxiety for the safety of Yedo bubbled over. Whether Osaka now or later, a war fleet has returned. Unless we are very careful war is inevitable. Enough of being careful. Agama leaned closer. I say whether there's landing at Osaka or not, we excise the boil on our balls and exterminate Yokohama. Now, if you will not, so sorry, I will.